Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Soybean Innovation Lab webinar, ICT Connectivity, the Oxygen of Today's Agricultural Researcher. My name is Amy Karianakis. I'm the Communications Manager for the Soybean Innovation Lab and will be your moderator today. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Feed the Future Soybean Innovation Lab, focused on improving soybean production and utilization across Sub-Saharan Africa. Today, we are joined by registrants from 37 different countries, representing organizations within the private sector, academia, development agencies, and research institutions. Big welcome to everyone here with us today. Before we begin, I would like to give everyone a quick overview of the GoToWebinar software, which you can use to engage with panelists, ask questions, and access webinar resources. Whether you're using the desktop or web application, you'll see a questions pane on your control panel. Please type in your questions as they arise, along with your organization and country. We will collect all of your questions and address as many as possible during the question and answer session at the end. Questions that are not answered during the webinar will receive a written response after the webinar has concluded. On your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a handouts pane. Expand this pane to access today's agenda, a contact list with important URLs, and the webinar presentation in its entirety. Depending on your connectivity, you may experience a lag in the transition of the slides during presentations. This presentation is available as a PDF in your handouts pane, so feel free to download it now and follow along at your own pace. I'd like to give a quick introduction of today's panelists in order of presentations on the agenda. First off, we have Paul Hickson and Tracy Smith. Paul is the lead researcher for the Soybean Innovation Lab's ICT Connectivity Program and the former CIO for the University of Illinois. Tracy Smith is the deputy CIO for Innovation and Technology at the University of Illinois. Together, they will be providing us with an overview of the current state of connectivity in Africa, as well as discussing their research and the ICT Health Checkup tool that came out of it. Paul will also be moderating our Q&A following all of today's presentations. Thank you for being with us today, Paul and Tracy. We also have Dale Smith joining us today from Eugene, Oregon. Dale is the International Networking Coordinator for the Network Startup Resource Center at the University of Oregon. Thanks for being here today, Dale. Next, I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Matthews Matumbuka and Omo Oya. Matthews is the CEO of UbuntuNet Alliance, and Omo is the Chief Strategy Officer for the West and Central African Research and Education Network. Thank you both for joining us today. We are also very excited to have Lucas Chigabatia with us today. Uh, Lucas is the Chief Information Officer for the University of Ghana. Thanks, Lucas. Next, I'd like to introduce Solomon Dindi. Solomon is the consulting CEO for the Malawi Research and Education Network. Thanks for being with us today, Solomon. And last but certainly not least, we have the privilege of Stain Mukandawire, the CEO of the Zambia Research and Education Network joining us today. Thank you for being here, Stain. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Paul Hickson and Tracy Smith to kick us off. Um, Paul and Tracy, you are welcome to begin whenever you're ready. Thanks very much, Amy. I am Paul Hickson, I'm the ICT Research Lead. Hi, and I'm Tracy Smith, Deputy CIO of Innovation at University of Illinois. And we're both going to be co-presenting today on an overview of ICT connectivity, the oxygen necessary for today's agricultural researcher. Next slide, please. So you may be wondering how and why this research developed and why did it come out of the Soybean Innovation Lab? Because SIL began in 2013 with a focus on helping colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa develop a comprehensive program on soybeans breeding, production, processing, marketing, consumption, etc. And when the program first started in 2013, SIL was operating in four partner countries in Africa. Next slide, please. But by 2018, the project had expanded 
and was now operating in 14 countries. And along the way, they discovered a very important new problem. Our partners at the National Ag Research System institutions almost universally were suffering from extremely poor ICT connectivity, as well as problems with their local IT infrastructure. And that's when and why this new initiative was started. Next slide, please. So right from the beginning, the goals of the ICT connectivity project have been threefold. First is to conduct reliable quantitative field research to clearly identify what are the major ICT connectivity and utilization challenges that NARS institutions face in Sub-Saharan Africa. The second is to develop recommendations for the most cost-effective ways to solve those problems. And third, share openly and freely with everyone, with the partner institutions and with the international donor community, the results of this research. Next slide, please. Why is this so important? I've been working in this field for actually over 50 years as a person who has long experience in the fields of supporting ag institutions as a communicator and also as an IT administrator. And over my career, I've observed that ICT connectivity and usage have totally transformed the world of ag researchers all around the world. Sub-Saharan Africa is no different, except they don't have good connectivity. And having access to and mastery of ICT tools has literally become the oxygen on which a modern egg researcher does her work. Without oxygen, you do not have life. Without oxygen, ICT cannot support the missions of these NARS institutions. Next slide, please. It is an exciting time though. There's more and more bandwidth coming into the continent every day. Hundreds of terabits of bandwidth from the Americas and from Asia and from Europe. And the, the fiber resources are readily available in the coastal regions, but it's important to know that there are great efforts underway to, right now to bring those fiber resources to the interior. Next slide, please. It's also important noting that African telecoms have leveraged this bandwidth to build out cellular, robust cellular networks throughout the continent. And that's important. Mobile has its place. Mobile serves a need. It's great that farmers in the field have access to the internet with their phones. But mobile doesn't solve every need. Next slide, please. Mobile doesn't solve the needs of the NARS Institutes, as an example. Um, the NARS Institutes need fiber networks. They need end-to-end -end fiber networks. The scientists at the NARS Institutes, they've got to be able to do more than just email. They've got to be able to do video and workshops and do outreach and engagement and do all of the ac academic education and research mission, fulfill those things. When those farmers or when agri-processors or other agribusinesses have issues and they need help, they reach out to those scientists at the NARS Institutes and those scientists need those resources to be able to, to, to help. We cannot have the farmers calling for help and the phone just rings. Next slide, please. So the first step that we did in this research project was to develop a reliable research tool. It's a fairly simple Excel spreadsheet, has four tabs and it's, password protected. Next slide, please. It looks at four things that are all essential for ICT to be successful. First is connectivity. Do you have enough? Second is physical infrastructure of the network. Is it sufficiently robust and trustworthy? Third is what internet services are delivered on top of it. Fourth, and certainly not last, are the ICT professional staff members who operate that. What resources do they have? And what training do they have? And just like a good table has to have four sturdy legs, in order for ICT to be successful, all four of those are important to be positive. Next slide, please. So as you're 
as you're evaluating those four legs, um, the nice thing about the tool is that it provides immediate feedback. You see r r yellow and red on institution A as an example, much like a traffic light. Green is good to go, which is on institution B, but yellow, there's caution, attention is needed, and red is there's an issue. So in institution A, the yellow, they had plans to address things, but hadn't had a chance to execute on the plan yet. In the red, they didn't have a plan yet. But you can see, again, in institution B, a lot of green, a lot of good to go. Next slide, please. So we gathered data from 14 entities in three countries, countries of Ghana, Malawi, and Zambia. We went to nine NARS institutions that are listed there. We talked with the National Research Education Networks, the NRENs, in each of those countries. And we also uh, interacted with representatives from the regional educational networks uh, in both West and East Africa. Next slide, please. So the, some key findings jumped out from our research. First, many NARS institutions are still relying far too heavily on commercial telecom for their connectivity. They find that the prices are too high, and then, because the prices are too high, they can't afford to buy much. So you have the worst of all conditions. They've spent a lot of money and don't have much to show for it. We also learned that in a number of locations, the NARS institutions don't even know what an NREN is or who the NREN is in their country or how to reach them. The third thing we realized very quickly is that yes, although all our data thus far has been pointing exactly in this direction, we need to be collecting more and more data the more data we get, the more trustworthy this data set becomes. So you're going to be hearing today from partners who are working with us and taking this ICT health checkup, using it within their own organization and getting the data back to us. At the end of the uh, webinar, we're going to invite any one of you who are connected with the NARS institution who would like, like to use this tool to get in touch with me and we can help you in that regard. Next slide, please. Did you know that there are many NARS institutes that struggle to even get 512 kilobits per second to the desktop of their scientists? A half a meg. If you compare and contrast that to those of those scientists, their colleagues in Europe and in the Americas and in the, U well, in the US, um, 25 megabits per second is, is the minimum, but what is standard is 1,000 megabits per second. How can those scientists have meaningful wide area collaborations with that disparity? And more importantly, how, how can they be competitive in a global environment? Paul, you experienced this firsthand when you were there. Yes, thanks, Tracy. So the green readings on the right-hand side are actual readings uh, from the ICT health checkup. So we have the very most my, uh, conservative standards in this ICT health checkup. We're saying that a senior researcher has got to have 512 kilobits, half a meg. And we're saying that a junior staff member has to have 128 KBPS, one eighth of a meg. I went to a number of places where the network just didn't work. I couldn't get any reading. I got one institution where the best reading I could get for a senior researcher was 90 KBPS. You're going to hear later about an instance where one of the institutions is able to get 4,000 KBPS, four megs. That's heaven. Yet look, over in the US and in Europe at those under other situations where people have anywhere from 50 to 2,000 times more connectivity. And the researchers at these NARS institutions in many cases have PhDs. These are sharp people at good quality institutions. They just don't have the oxygen they need. Next slide, please. 
So this is a side message to any members of our audience who are part of the donor community. My recommendation is if you want to make one of the biggest bang for the buck investments in Sub-Saharan Africa, I recommend considering increasing the development support for expanding ICT connectivity and utilization. Doing so, you can leverage the vast intellectual and existing physical resources throughout the continent at NARS institutions. And remember, ICT connectivity is the oxygen that's necessary for these folks to do ag research. Next slide, please. It's important to note the important role that the national research and education networks play. Um, not only do they provide access and connectivity among the institutions, they really build community. It's a better together kind of situation. Um, the NRENs, they broker relationships, they provide key services. And I can tell you at the University of Illinois, we are highly dependent on our NREN. It is, they play such an important role in our ability to have wide array collaborations and to be able to realize the true impact that we can have. They're a very important player, and it's really great that they're at the table here today. Next slide, please. So today, we're very fortunate, because you're gonna hear from colleagues who have deep experience in ICT issues across Sub-Saharan Africa. And you're going to have an opportunity to learn why NRENs offer the best path forward for NARS institutions, the best path by which NARS institutions can get both better bandwidth and lower prices to support their staff and their researchers. So there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end, but this concludes this part. Back to you, Amy. Awesome, thank you, Paul and Tracy, that was great. Um, before we continue, I'd just like to remind everyone to please type in your questions into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel and include your organization and country. Uh, we're going to address, as Paul said, as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, and then just as another reminder, this webinar is being recorded and that recording will be sent to you after the webinar concludes. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to uh, Dale Smith. Dale is going to talk a little about NSRC's role in all this and the Research and Education Network ecosystem. Dale, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, welcome uh, from uh, uh, early morning here in Eugene, Oregon. Next slide. So the Network Startup Resource Center uh, started in the late 80s, early 90s, and it's operated from the University of Oregon since 1996. Initially, our efforts were helping establish first internet connections for a number of countries and, and we provided uh, core assistance to many others. Our core funding comes to the U.S. National Science Foundation and Google, but we have funding from a number of other sources. The core uh, and the key uh, services we provide is training that uh, you know, trains up your ICT professionals engineering assistance, equipment donations, and community building. Next slide. In the last decade, we've uh, actually worked actively in 85 countries. I think you'll probably find the country you're from on this list. Next slide. And uh, I wanted to talk just for a minute about research and education networks. You've heard a little bit of introduction, but uh, I really want to emphasize the fact that research and education networks provide access to the internet, similar to an internet service provider, but they're purpose built, very specifically built to support the specific needs of the research and education community. Next slide. I like to think of the research and education networking as a ecosystem, and we're, we will talk in detail about two layers of this ecosystem, but I wanted to introduce the concept. Next slide. First, we'll look at global connections. You see uh, several maps from different perspectives. This is the map, or this is the perspective of Europe. You would see the perspective from the US and the perspective from Asia. I want now to talk for a minute about regional RENs. 
We have a number of African regional wrens represented on this call. The Ubuntu Net Alliance, which is in TAN on the right-hand side of the screen, and WACRN on, on the left-hand side of this uh, map uh, in green. Next slide. One of the key things that we want to touch base on and, and really emphasize, and this has already been mentioned, uh, it, uh, is that national NRENs are comparable to your internet service provider. So if you're buying a uh, service from Orange or MTN or Vodafone, uh, NRENs in your country are comparable. However, again, they're not motivated by profit and they are developed specifically to support your needs. They will come and uh, typically help you uh, look at your networks and think about ways to improve them after you've run the ICT uh, uh, checklist. Next slide. Finally, I want to talk about campus networks. This is the network at your research facility. And it's very important to note that no student, researcher, faculty member, uh, research assistant, anyone is connected to the global, national, or regional networks. They're all connected to your campus network at your research institute. Without a good campus network, the entire ecosystem is affected. So, you know, we could have the best and most expensive global connections and regional connections and, and national networks, but if your campus network, if the network on your research facility is, is poorly designed and performs poorly, the entire ecosystem is affected and the experience of that researcher is affected. So uh, I like to say the campus network is the foundation that the entire ecosystem is built on. Next slide. Many campus networks, particularly those in emerging regions, aren't properly designed and constructed. Many campus networks don't perform well and can't support high bandwidth connections. Uh, you, uh, the University of Illinois has developed this ICT checklist and we encourage you to use it. Next slide. So our call to action is go find out who your NREN is and any of us on this call uh, can, can tell you that. Uh, the next call is make sure your campus network is well architected and that it performs well. You can start by using the, the ICT health checkup. Next slide. Thank you. Our, our core focus is building international research and education network capacity, and we've done so since 1992. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. We really appreciate you taking the time to present today. Um, so we'd like to pause here to launch our first interactive poll. Uh, we use these polls as a way to get your feedback and to get an understanding of the range of attendees here with us today. So for our first poll, we'd like to know a little more about who's joining us today. So please identify which category best describes where you work. We'll give everyone a few moments to record their answer. Okay, and we'll be closing the polls in three, two, one. All right, so it looks like we've got a you know healthy mix here. Um, lots from lots of people from the from USA or the donor community. So um, yeah, so we'll be moving on. Thank you. Um, you know, it's great to get feedback from everyone uh, and know who's joining us today. So thanks. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to now turn it over to Dr. Matthews Matumbuka and Oma Oeya. They will be discussing how WACRN and Ubuntu Net Alliance help support member NRENs. Matthews and Oma, please begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as was mentioned by uh, Paul Hickson and um, uh, uh, Dale Smith, um, Ubuntu Net Alliance is in the Eastern and Southern Africa, and we have 16 NRENs, uh, 12 of them connected, 10 under development. Of a number of projects, uh, one of the big ones is the Africonic 3 project, which is funded by the European Union and covers not only our region, but also um, the, the uh, Wakren region. And to talk about services, my colleague Omo will talk about the services. 
Yeah, so um, Wakran is the Western Central African region. We have 14 entrants, three connected. We're effectively not just providing connectivity, but also catering for the plumbing, for scholarly communication and research infrastructure in general. Uh, we provide identity federations to support this and uh, open access repositories for the content. Next slide. So one of our main uh, support um, products that we give to our entrants is the provision of connectivity, as was mentioned the, uh, earlier on. And uh, we've connected uh, 14 countries in our region, and uh, in working we've connected three countries uh, already, supported by regional uh, capacity of four gigabits per second in Ubuntu Net Alliance and 10 gig in, uh, in, in West Africa. Uh, the capacity we have for international traffic is uh, 20 gigabits uh, per, per second in our region in Ubuntu Net here, and uh, 10 gigs uh, in, in Wakren. And we almost talk about the support that we, we give jointly to uh, our regional, uh, uh, to, to the entries in the two regions. So yes, yeah, so Dale had mentioned a little bit about the, the need for the basic building block uh, of this whole stack to be in good order. So a lot of what we do is building capacity amongst the engineers. We also are doing the same sort of uh, capacity building amongst information managers and the libraries and the researchers. We provide uh, opportunities for the CEOs of these young organizations, uh, the right management experience to create viable organizations and just generally sort of keep everything going. Next slide. So uh, one of the things we're doing is to develop the endlines. Some of the endlines are already big. For example, in Wakren, uh, uh, Ghana in Ghana, and the, the Nigerian endlines are big. Uh, but others are still medium and being developed to, to, to be big. But also, we have countries where we haven't yet established the endlines. Uh, in our case, for example, in the Ubunet Alliance, we have Angola, Swaziland, Mauritius, uh, Lesotho, where we do not have entrance and we're working hard to try and establish entrance. Our target uh, in Ubuntu Net Alliance is to try and get one new country established as an entrance uh, per year, and we hope that uh, this year uh, Mauritius might take off as an entrance, uh, and our, our colleagues in, in Wakrin are doing the same, so that uh, the whole of Africa in the next few years should all have uh, entrance and connected. And uh, if you look down there on the future of entrance, uh, we want to ensure that uh, more entries are connected, that we increase capacity, uh, but also that uh, we provide services beyond connectivity. Uh, and also we want governments to be involved uh, beyond the EU and World Bank, uh, but also to increase collaboration between the, the entries themselves. Uh, but we do have challenges al along the way as well. And my friend Omo talk about some of the challenges that we face. Well, funding is always, uh, is always the primary challenge. Yeah. This this pipes cost money. It costs money to uh, it costs in, in orders of magnitude. It is it costs ten times as much to build within a national boundaries as much as it does on the regional level. There are other issues like you know regulations, cross border regulations, uh, policy work that we have to do at uh, government level, and sometimes between governments when the connections uh, straddle borders. But on the whole. We are working towards those, improving access to funding opportunities locally and nationally and internationally. Next slide. Now, I'd like to talk about uh, five ways in which we think that the uh, entrance can work together with the NAS project. Uh, first, we think that uh, we, the entrance, are important in terms of connecting meteorological sites to some of the very high capacity, reliable, and yet quite affordable links that can help to predict weather forecasts. Uh, secondly, we think that uh, uh, the entrance can help in providing connectivity to some of the institutions in the agricultural sector, uh, which would help to deal with some of the emerging trends in agriculture, as well as threats like uh, the COVID pandemic, but also uh, global warming. And thirdly, we think that uh, we can help in connecting some of the scientists in agriculture, as well as researchers, uh, with their peers all over the world in dealing with some of the local as well as the global challenges. And fourthly, we believe that we can help uh, in terms of collaboration between the institutions in agriculture, uh, which would help them and empower them to find solutions 
to some of the major agricultural pro pro uh, problems. And finally, we believe that the NARS institutions can also help us, the regional rains as well as the national rains uh, economically. So we believe that this is a win-win uh, arrangement. And uh, with this, we would like to, to, to thank you for this uh, opportunity to share uh, with you some of the things we do, but also perhaps this as a platform for us to collaborate more with the with the rest of the players in this uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew Zanomo. Uh, that was great. We're getting uh, a lot of great questions so far, so please keep them coming. And again, please uh, be sure to include your organization and country. Uh, right now, we're going to shift gears a little and hear from some NRENs in different stages of development, uh, starting with Lucas Chigabatia, CIO of University of Ghana. Uh, Lucas, uh, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. Um... My name is Lucas Chigabatia, uh, CIO for the University of Ghana and coordinating for, for Garnet. Uh, Garnet was conceived in 1995 uh, to build an advanced network of institutions of higher learning uh, to support teaching, learning, and research. Uh, it also has the objective to connect libraries, hospitals. Uh, was incorporated in 2010 as a not-for-profit organization, but uh, continued to uh, be dormant until 2016. Uh, next slide. Um, at the moment, Garnet uh, has 20, 29 members, uh, 18 of those are from the public sector and 11 of those are from the uh, private sector. Uh, what you see before you is a distribution, a countrywide distribution where uh, the majority of our members are in the southern part. Our newest uh, member is the Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, which you see in the middle of the up north. Next slide. Uh, as of 2016, each member uh, uh, negotiated their own connection to the internet, and so there was not enough uh, opportunity for fostering online collaboration and, and resource sharing. Uh, next slide. Um, today, uh, as I already said, we have 29 members uh, connected to our national data center where our network is hosted. We have access to the Google Cache, which is a 10 gig pipe. We have another 10 gig pipe to our mother organization, that's Wakren. Uh, the minimum connection for last mile connection for our members is one STM uh, with the help of uh, some of the telcos aggregating their bandwidth through uh, their MPLS. Uh, Garnet Network Design envisages the establishment of POPs, one of which we've already done. You see on the right side of uh, the screen. The, the diagram, that's our first pop at the University of Science and Technology, which connects three of our members. Um, at the moment, each of our members have two connections, one through the commercial service provider and the second through Garnet. Next slide, please. Um, our latest member, um, Sari, uh, has a, an interesting story, which, uh, Paul, why don't you take it up? Thanks, Lucas. So actually, Sari was the first place that I used the ICT Health Checkup in 2018. And when I first went there, <clears throat> I did the four sectors that I explained the ICT health checkup covers. And sorry had problems in all of those areas. But the most outstanding problem was their connectivity. Their initial contract with their ISP, which was Vodafone Ghana, was for two megabits for the entire institution, which was 40 senior scientists and 100 staff members. And for that two Mbps per month, they were paying $722. About eight months into this, Sari switched to MTN to get more connectivity, but they only upped their connectivity to the main campus at Nungpala to 10 MB. Again, that's for 140 people. And their costs went from 722 up to $3,706 a month. Next slide, please. So in the beginning, it was obvious that Sari was focused totally on the telcos to solve their problem. They were unaware that there was even an NREN in Ghana, let alone knowing that its name was Garnett or who to reach to ask about Garnett becoming 
their ISP, and their NREN. I was able to put the two parties together, Sari and Garnett. And Garnett agreed to come to Sari and conduct a site analysis, and their site analysis confirmed and expanded on the findings that I had found. And Garnett just completed trenching new fiber to Nangpala and has installed 155 Mbps, all fiber service, to Sari. Now, here's the interesting part. The new bandwidth charges are going to be $4,208. Next slide, please. So when you put all this into a graph, they began with only two. They moved to 18 megs. Now they're at 155. We've talked in the middle about what the cost was per month. Look what it is per MB. When they were with their first ISP, they were paying $360 per MB per month. Their second, again a telco, they were paying 206. But by the time they moved to their NREN, Garnett, they were only paying $27 per MB. Next slide, please. So again, I want to reemphasize that the ICT Health Checkup uses very conservative standards. I was only seeking to find if every researcher could get half a meg and a hundred and one eighth of a meg for junior staff members. But with Garnet, Every researcher at Sari is going to have a nearly full 4 Mbps of bandwidth. And lastly, keep in mind what we showed in the earlier presentation. While that's wonderful, it pales in comparison to what their colleagues in Europe, Asia, or North America are having as their standard bandwidth. Thanks. Next slide, please. And, and to put all of this into perspective, um, before Garnet came on to the scene, um, the members were procuring one MBPS at $43, 13 cents. Um, as soon as Garnet came on board, uh, they felt the competition and dropped their rates from 41 to $23.63. Uh, that's a huge savings. Uh, Garnet currently offers uh, one Mbps at $18.62, uh, which translates into a savings of about 161000 every month and cumulatively annually at uh, around $2 million. Next slide, please. Now, the services that Garnet provides uh, with the help of the regional REN, WACREN, uh, AGROM services, video conferencing through Zoom, uh, we're able to negotiate uh, uh, lease executes at standard rates uh, because of the combined muscle of the membership. Uh, we do provide training workshops. And here I have to uh, mention NS NSRC, who helped greatly in delivering such services. Uh, we have recently negotiated a mobile data bundle for tertiary institutions who are our members um, to be able to access learning content from home. Uh, this was done through swapping dedicated bandwidth to mobile data. Uh, we also did negotiate on their behalf a zero rating of all educational content. And uh, we do provide access to high performance computing for our members. Um, now, cost savings I've talked about, uh, we've been able to, through this, strengthen Wi-Fi uh, connectivity on the campuses where a lot of bandwidth, or significantly more bandwidth is not available. And it's interesting to mention that the recent uh, successful genome sequencing by researchers at the University of Ghana was done um, using uh, improved bandwidth and the deployment of uh, high performance computing. Next slide. Now, in terms of impacts to uh, uh, staff, students, and faculty, it's about uh, 250,000 uh, to 35,000 students, 15,000 researchers, and members of faculty. Uh, we estimate that 10,000 administrators have benefited from this. And in terms of gender, it's a split 50, 55 to 45 uh, between male and female, which is significant. Um, 
Going forward, we'll be looking forward to deploying a shared service uh, learning management platform for our members who have not been able to afford that. Uh, we'll continue to collaborate with Wakren to deploy Identity Federation, uh, help our members with security and network monitoring, and also data backup and institutional repositories. Um, we do have benefactors, I mentioned a few, the World Bank, uh, Wakren, NSRC, and the Government of Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lucas. We appreciate you taking the time to tell us about everything Garnet has to offer. Thank you. Um, so now it's uh, time to launch our next interactive poll. Um, for this poll, we'd like to know uh, what ICT connectivity issues do you face when working at or visiting a NARS institution in Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, please select all that apply. We'll give everyone a few moments to record their answer. Very well. Okay, and we'll be closing the poll in three, two, one. All right, so it looks like the biggest issues are, are slow performance and the inability to connect or stay connected. Okay. All right, so we will go ahead and be moving on. Our next presenter will be Solomon Dindi, the consulting CEO from the Malawi Research and Education Network. Solomon, feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Solomon Dindi, and I'm the consulting CEO for the Malawi Research and Education Network. Next slide, please. So MARIN uh, is the uh, NREN in Malawi. It was founded in 2007, and it did evolve from what is called the Malawi Research and Lib Malawi Libraries and Information Consortium. What had happened at this point is that librarians were trying to negotiate for affordable access to content. Indeed, they managed to do that. However, the problem was access to the content that they, are manage they managed to uh, negotiate for. And at this point, they thought it necessary to see how best you can improve internet connectivity in this country. And that's when Marin was born. So in 2009, we proceeded to register Marin as a not for profit. And the, unfortunately, it took about nine years for us to be fully operational through a funding from the World Bank. So as Paul mentioned, it's quite important for donors to come in in some cases so that entrants become operational. Look at our case in Malawi. It has taken us about nine years for the NREN to become operational. Now, as a startup, Marin has three members of staff on the ground, the CEO, the CTO, and an admin assistant. And of course, we expect to get more staff uh, as we become operational. But we make sure that we keep the staffing at a minimum to avoid uh, paying a lot of bills in terms of salaries and other benefits. Since an NREN is our, in our case, the NREN is not for profit. We don't want to spend a lot of money on it. Next slide, please. Now, let me uh, not go much on the past. Today, we are operational. Let's see the building blocks that were put together to make the NREN start offering its services. So I'll discuss five basic building blocks that were worked on to make the uh, NREN start offering services to its clients. The first one is international connectivity. As I'm speaking, Marin has an idle capacity of 422 Mbps, uh, which is going through our neighbor Zambia. And uh, we realized that this is not, after we did some survey, we realized this is not adequate. Uh, we decided to procure some more. The extra procurement is being done through um, World Bank funding. The first one came through Africa Connect 2. Now for the second one, that's the extra capacity. This should be going live in July uh, this year. And we are, that's the indication we've managed to get from the regional provider, Ubunet Alliance. Thanks, Ubunet, for that indication. We are moving on. Now, apart from the international connectivity, as an REN we also need national circuits, which are going to distribute connectivity between our POP, the main POP, and the various member institutions. And as of now, for about uh, 37 institutions, we need about 1,600 megabits per second capacity to be able to interconnect these 37 institutions. You may be wondering why this is 
good news for us, you may notice that currently the 37 institutions are using only about 455 megabits per second as a total. So moving on from 455 to 1,600 plus is a big improvement. I think we'll improve more and more from that. Uh, on this national connectivity, we should be signing the contract ten time this month, and they, this is going to one of the local providers called OCL, that's Open Connect Limited. And uh, the beauty with this is that this provider has circuits across the country, so it will become quite easy for them to link us up to the various institutions that would want to connect. The other building block for our network is the uh, numbers, internet number resources, which are going to be used for identification for both our network as well as the various devices on our network. So in this regard, we managed to acquire an autonomous system number from Afrinic, which is the regional provider. We also managed to get large chunks of public IP addresses in terms of IPv4 as well as IPv6. Uh, on the first one, IPv4, we have a slash 17 block, which is close to 32,000 IP addresses, and the for IPv6 is a slash 40, which is adequate to cover all the institutions in this country, Malawi. Next slide, please. The other building block is the setting up of what is called a network operation center. So on this, so far we have had contracts signed uh, for the various suppliers to uh, supply us with equipment and uh, delivery of equipment is underway and we are hoping that by the end of July we are going to have all the equipment delivered. Of course on this there was a delay because of COVID-19, so some suppliers were getting things from China. But then, as China was on lockdown at some point, the delivery was delayed. But now there are indications they will have to deliver this by uh, the end of July. The other building block that we want as an NREN is the ISP license. You know, as a service provider, we need to be licensed. In this regard, we made an application to the regulator, and the license was granted this year in February. And uh, this license, the beauty is it allows us to connect any post-secondary school institution as well as any teaching hospital. Of course, this is a slight departure from the actual definition of higher education. Basically, Marin was supposed to deal with higher education, particularly universities and university colleges. But then the government of Malawi has given us a waiver to make sure that we can connect other post-secondary institutions. The other beauty with this license is that it gives us two exemptions. The first one is that we are not supposed to pay any license fees to the regulator, and this is paid at $10,000 per year. At the same time, the regulator gets 3.5% levy on a revenue generated from any of the licensees. In our case, we have been exempted from paying that 3.5%. So in our case, we think this is a plus because the cost of paying the $10,000 as well as the 3.5% levy will not be passed on to our clients. So this will make the cost of services quite affordable to most of our member institutions. Next slide, please. The other building block, uh, well, I think I talked about our discuss only five. So I have done that. Let me proceed to uh, what I would get if I compared Marin to commercial providers in, in Malawi. So the major issue is really about pricing. So as of now, the cheapest provider, except for Marin, is at a minimum of $130 per MB per month. Marin is offering the same bandwidth at $85. Now, the beauty in our case is that $85, this is the cost, uh, the price that we give to an end user uh, at their institution. The $130 is what you get if you go to commercial providers, but then the, this is what you get at their pop and you have to find your own means to your end point. So that means the actual cost is more than $130. In our case, 85 is what somebody gets at their institution. Beyond uh, connectivity, now to look at Marin being different from commercial providers, uh, the other part is we provide other and one services beyond connectivity. So in a nutshell, we look at things like cloud-based systems, we give like chunks of public IP addresses, we provide capacity uh, building, more particularly, I need to mention that uh, uh, institutions like ISOC, AFNOG, Obunet Alliance, NSLRC, they're quite handy in such capacity training uh, trainings for our members. Uh, we also look at uh, specific services uh, for higher education, including EDUROM and VPN. We also look at issues of uh, academic cert. So okay, next slide, please. So, 
having looked at the basic building blocks, the question that people might be asking would be when should we institutions expect to start getting the services from Maren? So our expectation based on the five building blocks I've talked about is that there is anticipation that we'll start protecting clients from the 1st of August this year or immediately thereafter. Of course, we also had some meetings with Ubunet Alliance trying to say, if we start connecting our clients on 1st August, how much time do you give us uh, to, for them to test our services as long as for us to test their Ubunet services? Because it will be, while Ubunet is giving us the international services, at the same time, we need to connect the institution. So on our part as an NREN, we need to be testing, but at the same time, our member institutions are also be testing the same. So we are negotiating with the Alliance at the reasonable period within which the tests should be done. Moving forward, as Marin, we are engaging individual institutions on the forthcoming offerings. We're also planning to provide support to the institutions. Um, we're also providing, looking at um, use of ICT health checkup to get high level picture of uh, what are the needs at each institution. What we, once we get the high level needs at each institution, we need now to get into the details of what is required for each network. In this case, we are planning to use the tool that we got from Network Startup Resource Center. Net, next slide, slide please. So I give an example of one of the NAS institutions in Malawi, uh, which is called Longo Investor of Agriculture and um, Natural Resources, uh, Rwanda for short. It's the third public investor in the country. It has three campuses, and this institution offers both undergraduate and postgraduate programs. Now, in terms of how much it's spending, look at a whooping $18,000 and only a Miyaga 80 megabits per second. And this is supposed to be given to 12,000 users. What an imbalance. Too much expenditure, little bandwidth, too many users. An assessment using the ICT, check, uh, ICT Health Checkup tool revealed that the network infrastructure at Rwanda is quite poor. Next slide, please. Now, in, since the infrastructure is poor, Marin is already on the ground working with the NAS institution at this point. We have already provided some technical training on best practices on campus networks. Of course, this was facilitated by our colleagues from UNED Alliance uh, towards the end of last year. We have also identified equipment which we are going to use to enhance uh, Wi Fi equipment, uh, sorry, Wi Fi at Rwanda. We have also helped them by providing them IP addresses, both IP version 4 and IP version 6. And moving forward on Rwanda, there is, uh, Mar Marin is providing Rwanda with increased bandwidth at power cost per MB. We want to deliver stable and more reliable internet services. We also want to offer other advanced services with institution as well as provide Rwanda with ICT oxygen needed to provide fulfill their mission. Next slide, please. Marin has come on the ground. It's there to assist as an NRED, we are not for profit. We're not there to make any extra monies. All we want to do is to support higher education. Now, if you are in as institution represented here, get in touch with us. The contacts are shown on the screen. Looking forward to get to your communication. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. We appreciate you being with us today. That was great. Um, our, our last presenter is uh, Stain McCandawiri, CEO for the Zambia Research and Education Network. Stain, feel free to begin whenever you're ready. Uh, Stain, I think you're muted. Oh, your sound's on, but we cannot hear you. Um, unfortunately, I don't think your mic's working. It was working earlier. Let's see, we'll give you just a couple seconds there. Nope, we're not hearing anything. No sound. Do you want to try unplugging your headset and plugging it back in? See if that'll work. Oh, I think we can hear you now. Hello, can you get me yes. now? We can, oh, perfect. perfect. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah, thank sure. you. So, All right. So <clears throat> I've said my name is Tim Kandari, I'm the CEO of Zambia Research and Education Network. Next slide.
Yeah, so the motivating factors why Xamarin was uh, formulated or was set up was because of the cost of our internet. Uh, at that time, it was quite high, and uh, we wanted our research and education institutions to get connected. They could not collaborate, and it was quite expensive also, the infrastructure. At that time, there was only VSAT that was being used, and the, the cost of maintenance and installation were quite high and also low skills levels in uh, uh, with our uh, campus uh, staff. Next slide. So status of Xamarin, so this the legal status. So it, it was first registered in 2007 as a non-profit making uh, internet service provider and continues to be like, like that. In 2012, it was operationalized and uh, funding from the Netherlands government uh, through NUFIC and in 2016 we changed its uh, registration status to a company <clears throat> by guarantee. The reason was that uh, under register of societies we could only take up to 50 institutions but we grew more than 50 and so the law demanded that we change from uh, register of societies to uh, PACRA. PACRA is patent uh, company registration agency. Next slide. Yeah, so in terms of objectives of Zambrin, I think they're common with any other NREN, uh, whether in Africa or uh, beyond Africa. Next slide, please. So category of membership, we wanted to, to be very specific because the law demands that uh, we should operate within the law. So we operate and we connect institutions that are in education and research in NETA, then also communities of practice. These are like uh, uh, those that uh, regulate the professional bodies in Zambia and also anchor institutions. Anchor institutions are those that support uh, learning and research institutions in Zambia. Next slide, please. So in terms of growth, since we started in 2012 to date 2020, we're talking about eight years uh, in existence. Uh, so how have we fared? So in terms of our growth, we, we've taken like we've got uh, public and private and also got research institutions, we've also got, uh, we've also got uh, the anchor institutions. So this gives us the statistics. We stand at 130, 134 institutions so far. Next slide, please. So we also look at uh, how we fared in terms of uh, internet uptake. When we started in 2012, we only had about 155 megabits per second. As things stand now, we had 202.8 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Uh, next slide, please. And we keep on growing, and we'll see that you we'll have more capacity as we finish uh, our payment towards Africa Connect 2. So in terms of pricing, we also see that currently we have got a, it's a three-tier pricing structure that we we are we are using at Zambrain. So um, the lowest is at at fifty-seven dollars per megabit per second. The next is sixty-four dollars at megabits per second and seventy-two dollars at megabits per second. The seventy-two dollars per megabit per second. This is the graph that you are seeing here that is being shown here because we take uh, this is where most institutions fall. So those who are paying uh, less are those which are getting more capacity from us. So if you get more, you pay less because numbers have to kick in and to sustain also Zambra. Next, next slide, please. So here we try to compare the uptake against pricing. What have we contributed so far to growth of internet, which we, we said was scarce and also, also it was expensive. So we see as we get more, the price also tends to go down but we also tend to go up. So in terms of our, our contribution, in terms of our, how we have fared in Zambia, is that we are uh, a game changer in terms of pricing and also in terms of uptake, because some ISPs, commercial ISPs, cannot match with us in terms of capacity that we are providing. Next slide, please. So we see that in our case, we're providing more capacity and we are in all the 10 provinces of Zambia, um, so 
and we offer uh, distinguishable services to our member institutions. We call them member institutions. These are not our clients. So in terms of uh, service portfolio, we see that we've got internet at 134. Then we've got EGROM. EGROM are doing very fine. So in all the provinces of Zambia, you go there, you find that we've deployed EGROM. Also got um, high performance computing 72 users. And these 72 years are cutting uh, across Africa. And they're coming from Benin. And they're coming from Nigeria. From Nigeria so different users come and use our services and we also have seen of late the meteorological department of Zambia are using uh, our high performance compu computing to predict weather patterns uh, yesterday they were predicting weather patterns that it will go below uh, zero degree sessions because they're using our high performance computing we also have Moodle. Moodle actually I'm from meeting now meeting institutions the uptake of Moodle is increasing each week, we're seeing a lot of institutions now uptaking Moodle. The only challenge that we have now is the number of our systems uh, engineers to train users how to upload and use Moodle. Next slide, please. So that's where we're having a challenge. But now the response due to COVID-19, we see a lot of institutions now uptaking Moodle. Um, when we're talking about what has necessitated the decrease of cost, uh, compared to increase in quality of service that we provide. Uh, Zamblin does not work in isolation, there's good partners. Uh, for, for us in Zambia, we're very lucky. Uh, unlike other INRANs in Africa, we have got the power utility company uh, where we're writing uh, because I've got a national fiber and we write on that fiber at no cost. We also have got our ICT regulator, which is uh, helping us to roll out optic fiber so that uh, the last mile connectivity for us all these institutions, as long as they are public institutions, they are not paying for last mile connectivity. The ICT regulator is taking care of that. So we can see that also participating in Africa Connect 1 and Africa Connect 2, funded by the EU, that is helping us to bring down the cost. We are not spending so much money on equipment. Uh, National uh, Network Startup Resource Center is coming in. Uh, Center for High Performance Computing. Computing South Africa is coming, also Indiana University is coming in, also with training, because if you train, train your people, they may not know how to, to manage the service and that will compromise on the quality of service. So we train the trainer, also assisted by Network Startup Resource Center of University of Oregon. We also um, conduct some, some workshops on, the, on Persona, how to deploy Persona to see exactly the quality of service that we are providing. And also go on to upgrade our equipment of the Junipers, uh, MX480. And these are also helping to ensure that we. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Jane, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't know whether I lost connectivity. I don't know. Are you getting uh, me now? Yeah, we can hear you. We didn't lose you. Um, we're on uh, how can an NREN offer lower costs for ICT connectivity than the commercial telecoms? I'm there now. I can see it. So we have to, you, uh, one has to belong to a regional body who, who, who normally do an uh, IRIU uh, to procure in bulk in terms of uh, capacity, also belong to uh, external partners uh, through regional bodies like Ubuntu Net Alliance and the European Union. Uh, also internal partnerships I, I, I talked about, uh, our power utility company through Fibercom and Zikta and also bulk procurement of capacity from Ubuntu Net Alliance it helps us also to, to lower our, to, to, to have lower cost of internet as compared to commercial telecoms. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. A benefit of belonging to Zamrain, we see that we, we offer uh, free expert training to our member institutions. We also provide advanced services like EGROM, which have deployed in 116 institutions. We've got high performance computing. We're also, we have also frozen uh, hosting fees for Moodle to, to our member institutions. So we're hosting Moodle in our cloud at, uh, at free. They are not paying anything. We're also training people how to use Moodle to upload their content. Lower internet tariffs, which we are providing currently, 
We also have got the brokered services like Astria e-library, donations of equipment. Once we receive this equipment, we also give it out to these member institutions. We also offer free workshops uh, and network audits to improve uh, service delivery. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh. So we see importance of expanding ICT services to NARS institution for Zambia and why it is important for NARS institutions as well. It promotes collaborative research. We feel that if these institutions belong to us and the service that we are providing to them, there will be collaborative research that will take place. We also see that there's a, a cross breeding of ideas. Uh, a researcher in Zambia may be lacking in one area, but a researcher maybe in America may have some ideas. So we see that there's cross breeding of ideas and it also promotes modernization. We feel uh, the way research is supposed to be done nowadays, you cannot do a research in isolation. So you have to come up with the, you have to partner with others. That is modernization way of uh, carrying out research. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of IC checkup, which we feel we have benefited uh, as well? This, to us, it's, it is the heartbeat of an institution's network. It, it shows exactly what you are lacking and how you can improve. So it promotes actual against planned in real time. What you see uh, uh, and what you perceive, they, they could be different. We believe the ICT health checkup, it's a way to go because for us, when we carried out some tests with the University of Zambia, uh, when we compared staff to students, we found that even those researchers were getting very little bandwidth without the ICT health checkup, would not have known to say, uh, UNSA uh, is not getting enough bandwidth from us, but that has to be tied also compared to the cost. So that is why we've got the three tier pricing to ensure that those institutions have got big staff and students, they can have more capacity at a lower cost. So costs are determined and factored into yearly budgets. This kicks in. It provides procurement of actual capacities. You have already done your assessment and you have compared and therefore you can exactly acquire or procure what you need. It also eliminates bottlenecks as you or try to find the actuals against what you, you perceive. Uh, this is what we are doing as Amrin. I thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you very you much, Amrin. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time to present today. That was great. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and uh, dive into all the great questions um, our attendees have submitted. Um, I hope you all stick around. Uh, Paul Hickson will be the moderator for our Q&A session today. I'm going to go ahead and let him get started so that we can try and get to as many of your questions uh, before we conclude for the day. Paul? Thanks, Amy. And uh, panelists, a general reminder, please keep your responses as brief as possible so we can respond to the question but still address as many questions as possible. So let's start with the first question, and we got this in a couple forms. Uh, one was from Alan Payne uh, from UK, and we had another researcher from uh, the University of Illinois ask a similar question. What specific things are required by a research internet network compared with a commercial one? And Alan noted that in the case of Garnet, 155 Mbps connection was the minimum. How much of that capacity is being normally used or is there a lot of spare? Lucas, could you answer that question, please? Uh, Lucas, I think you're muted. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. All right. So. Um, because we uh, had to negotiate with the telcos um, and we asked for a very low price, uh, they wanted us to commit to a certain capacity. Now, most of our members uh, who use uh, one STM as a minimum uh, find it even inadequate. So some of them have two STMs and, uh, and so that is the reason we, we had to negotiate bulk procurement uh, we committed to one STM as the minimum. Uh, it's not always uh, adequate, but um, uh, for for most of them, it is it is sufficient. 
So, and to clarify, uh, Lucas, one STM is 155 Mbps, right? Yes, yes, that's correct. Okay, and as long as we're on that question, uh, a related question was, what was the key success factor for getting your system upgrades in place? Okay, so um, the critical success factor for even getting Garnet up and running is management support, support from the stakeholder group. So we had a lot of support from uh, the vice chancellor's group in Ghana, which is called uh, VCG. And then also uh, we had support from the funding agency through our Ministry of Communications. That's the World Bank funding under uh, AC3. And then of course, we need the commitment and cooperation of my uh, colleagues at the various uh, institutions, the IT directors, and of course, with the support of their management. But uh, management support is secured through the vice chancellor's group. The next level of cooperation is the IT directors and, uh, uh, and uh, technical leads, and then government and the funding agencies. So these are very critical for achieving success. Thanks, Lucas. So our next question, uh, I'm going to uh, be asking uh, Stain uh, Makandawiri to reply to. This comes from Astrina Yulianti in Indonesia. So we have a global audience here. Please explain NRENS more specifically. And she says, I want to try to describe what the institutions in my country are approaching how they are approaching this function. Please explain what an NREN does that makes it different from a regular ISP. See? Yeah, an NREN is a national research and education network that operates in their countries to meet the needs of their education and research institutions. And basically, you are talking about students and lecturers. You're also talking about researchers. Researchers normally they will come from a university, and these people will need a lot of connectivity. Now, to to do research and meaningful research, you have to collaborate. You must have tools, and one of the tools that I spoke about was high performance computing. You are trying to design a product. You are trying to do some modeling. You are trying to do some simulations. You are trying to do some predictions, and these can only be found among NRENs because they have a good will from uh, communities within their countries and communities outside uh, their countries. And in this case, I was giving an example of Network Startup Resource Center of University of Oregon, and also giving uh, an example of High Performance Compu uh, Computing Center of South Africa. I also talked about the um, Indiana University. These are partners which commercial ISPs cannot collaborate, cannot form partnership of this nature. They will not because they are for profit. They are motivated by profit. We are not motivated by profit. We are non-profit making organization in our communities and beyond our communities. That is why we belong to regional bodies who in return uh, go into uh, irrevocable right of use of infrastructure. So that is how, that is, if you're looking at that perspective, that's how we differ from commercial ISPs. We can come to you now, we are collaborating. Commercial ISPs cannot talk to you, uh, Paul Hickson, because there is no profit. I mean, because they, for them, they are motivated by profit. For us, we're not motivated by profit. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. That's a great uh, explanation. Uh, so another question uh, comes from uh, wanting to know, uh, and this is gonna be going to Solomon, what are the next key steps? Uh, this is coming from a researcher in the US. What are the next key steps for uh, the Luanar University uh, to get connectivity? Solomon? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, the beauty is in the case of Luana, we have been, been in touch with them. 
right from the time the World Bank gave us the funding. So we have engaged them through and through. Uh, we have had meetings uh, both with uh, the IC directorate, just in order for them to appreciate what we are doing and the expected timelines within which we are going to start offering services. Um, beyond that, as I said in my presentation, we have worked with them to do some assessments on the ground with technical support from Moonet Alliance. We did some assessment in terms of their network. We submitted a report to the university in terms of the gaps that are there. So our expectation is that with the report in place, they should be able to make some improvements because I think if you followed uh, Dell's presentation, you will notice that even if the endrain can give you back good bandwidth, you find if you have a poor network at campus, people will not see the difference between what is their current rate versus what Marinwood is going to offer. So our expectation is that they're going to make some further improvements on the network. And of course, for this case of Luana, coincidentally, the librarian is one of the board members of Marin. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Solomon. Um, and then we have a question here uh, that I'm going to ask Matthews to respond to. Um, and this comes from uh, Mandefro Negusi uh, from the Ethiopian Institute of Ag Research. Our national NERS is called Ethernet and already connected, it is already connected to regional NERS, but they provide service only for universities in Ethiopia. Agricultural research institutes and centers are not yet connected. There is a project called AgriNet to connect research institutes and research centers across Ethiopia, but it has not yet started. So what do you recommend to the folks in Ethiopia from your experience in other countries? Is education, are education and research, are, let me start that again. Is education and agricultural institutes connected with the same network shared infrastructure? So they're seeking guidance in the case of Ethiopia of how to get their research institutes connected in addition to their universities. Uh, many thanks, Paul. Um, unfortunately, Matthews has just left. So okay. this is Hastings, um, the communications officer here at Robot Alliance. So in the case of uh, Ethernet, um, as the, the name suggests, Ethernet is a education research and education network of Ethiopia. So it might cater for both the education institutions as well as the agricultural institutions. So what I would advise the, um, the, 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 the person that has presented the question is to uh, contact the NLN. Um, if we can uh, contact me if you want, I can put you in contact with the uh, Asefa Zeralem, who is the uh, the CEO, I'm sure they would have something for for, the, for them. It wouldn't be uh, much of a difficulty to connect the, the agricultural research institution. Thank you. Great, thanks, Hastings. And uh, I, our last question uh, comes from, um, and I'm going to direct this one to Dale. Uh, it comes from Dick Tinsley uh, and Colorado State University. And his question is, how often are donors providing computer and connections, but not maintenance funding? And he goes on to say, so computers and connections are very limited. However, if you go off campus, there are private internet cafes that are operating. Perhaps they're slow, but at least they're operating. I think he's asking, what ongoing, is ongoing support for physical infrastructure a problem? And if so, how is it addressed? Y yes, it is a significant problem. And, uh, you know, this is uh, something we, we often call uh, donor fatigue in that uh, people will donate all kinds of things. And, and uh, in the Western world, we'll often take, oh, a bunch of old computers and we'll think, oh, this would be great. And we'll, you know, package them up and ship them off uh, and, you know, half of them don't work and, you know, it, it, it's just not a good situation. Um, we do see um, major funding agencies, uh, USAID and World Bank, who will provide significant funds 
uh, yet uh, recurring costs are an issue. And, and you know, uh, it, this is a, a common it, uh, kind of problem in that a, as a donor, you want to get enough where uh, things are self-sustaining, you know, uh, uh, and um, it, it's always a balance. Um, I've done quite a bit of work uh, looking at both capital costs and recurring costs for ICT, uh, and I can tell you that as we look, uh, particularly in countries where bandwidth is quite expensive, um, the recurring costs often in a five-year period will outweigh the initial capital costs. So, so recurring costs are a significant issue, and uh, if a donor is only looking at addressing one-time capital costs, um, it, I think we're a little bit missing the boat. Yeah, and if I can add to that, just to uh, complement the work that colleagues at NSRC are doing, that responsibility of even knowing whether to accept a gift, and a gift may come with implications down the road um, that um, make it not, not a smart thing to accept. Um, and the ability to discern that comes with the training that you guys are providing. And also, as these RENs and NRENs gain in strength, as, as Tracy said, you start to have strength in the community. And the ability of one NREN to reach out to another and say, hey, I just had this happen. How did you respond to a similar uh, situation? And I've observed it here in the US that the strength of these professional connections, which is what you guys are building, um, starts to get to a critical point. And yes, it's, it's at a developmental stage, but we've got some real resources uh, involved in, in getting these institutions up and running. So I think that, that the capacity to make that smart decision is improving year over year. Yes, I mean, and building a critical mass of ICT expertise uh, in a country or a region is something you know we have worked on for decades and decades. And Sub-Saharan Africa really is in a pretty good state at this point. And while we have some countries that still struggle, uh, you know, there is a lot of ICT expertise in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and we're very happy about that. Thanks, Dale. I said, actually, there is one more question that we have, and that is, Stane, could you talk about the change in the level of connectivity at the 134 institutions that you are currently serving, your members? That's a pretty dramatic increase. How did that come about? Uh, we're not hearing you, Steve. Now we are there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, in my presentation, I talked about uh, the aggregate bandwidth for all education research institutions in Zambia being 37 megabits per second. Is it 34? 37 megabits per second. That was the aggregate. And that meant that uh, uh, carrying out any research was practically impossible. This included the private universities and the public universities. So moving from an aggregate of 37 megabits per second to 2.8 gigabits per second has a number of factors. One of the factors is that in Zambia, we are privileged that the power utility company has given us a free ride on their national wide optic fiber. The national ICT regulator known as ZICTA is funding the last mile connectivity to public institutions. And therefore, we are able to reach institutions with that kind of funding. In terms of equipment, 
we get that equipment to connect our member institutions from Network Startup Resource Center. Then Ubuntu Net Alliance comes in to negotiate for a revocable right of use of infrastructure and they procure this capacity, coupled with funding from European Union. These factors have made us now bring down the cost of connectivity to our member institutions. I saw Ghana making a presentation. So the list they, they provide, it's STM1. In Zambia, we cannot provide STM1 because we cater for so many institutions. We provide this connectivity to secondary schools. Right now, as we are talking, because of COVID-19, there are public secondary schools who have gone on Moodle and they need to use that connectivity because we know the capacities cannot be STM1. So we host the Moodle on our infrastructure. As we host this Moodle on our infrastructure, it saves this institution from bandwidth of uploading the content from their servers. So the content is being uploaded from our servers on our, uh, on our cloud environment. So the list that we give, it's five megabits per second to secondary schools, not colleges, but to secondary schools, because most of these secondary schools, they are day secondary schools, meaning that the students, they are at home. Even when they are on campus or at school, it's the teachers that use that connectivity. But mind you, teachers are always teaching. So when they've got free periods, and that's the time they will use the connectivity. So we give that five megabits per second to secondary schools. But for colleges, we recommend more than five megabits per second. Thanks. And with that answer, I think we can see the unique ways that each of these NRENs is able to respond to their national environment. And one NREN in one country has the opportunity to learn from others. My concluding comments um, would be that <clears throat> this just shows what a rapidly changing environment this is. Hopefully you now have a better understanding of why NRENs offer a different type of service for a NARS institution. And one that is, yes, it is an ISP, but it is far more than an ISP. And it will help you at a NARS institution develop ways, strategies that will increase your bandwidth, decrease your costs, and improve your support across the all four component parts of the ICT infrastructure. And I want to close by reminding folks that if you are at a NARS institution and are interested in using the ICT Health Checkup with your institution, please contact me. There is contact information at the end of the slide deck that you'll be getting with this presentation. And we can set you up to work uh, with me and we will uh, help you assess the ICT needs, strengths, and weaknesses of your institution. That information will be shared back with you and your institution, and it will become a part of the larger data set. So I think that's all the questions we had, Amy. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Paul. Also, big thank you to all of our panelists, Tracy, Dale, Matthews, Omo, Lucas, Solomon, and Stain for taking the time to be with us today. I'd also like to thank all of our great attendees today for your interaction and your questions. Uh, this concludes the ICT connectivity, the oxygen of today's agricultural researcher webinar. Thank you so much for your participation. Uh, as Paul mentioned, if you are interested in obtaining a copy of the ICT Health Checkup tool that was discussed today, please contact Paul Hickson. Uh, today's webinar has been recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you in a follow-up email. When you exit the webinar today, you'll be asked to complete a short exit survey. We really appreciate all of your feedback and the time you've spent with us, so please take just a few moments to complete the survey. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day or evening.
stay safe and healthy out there. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.